Hi guys, welcome to episode five of the Gilded Age. I'm going to try to get through about 50 slides today. Um, let me get my clicker. So I'm gonna try to stay on point here. Railroading and government regulation. All right, so everybody is crystal clear that the 19th century equals railroads, 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 railroads. You know that equals Stanford in the West and you know that equals Vanderbilt in the East, as well as many others. Jay Gould is a terrible robber baron that was took lots and lots of money. He owned railroads. Uh, it's a big, big industry. Okay, railroad companies had shady relations with politicians and abused Americans' farmers. You have to know Americans' farmers were just screwed as a result of these railroads. They had sky-high rates, led the government to begin regulating this industry that was so vital to the health of the American economy. The problem is, is that they didn't really do that all the way until we get to Teddy Roosevelt. Like they said they were doing it, and we claimed that was happening, but it just wasn't enforced. Okay, millionaires and millionaires. Millionaires were the result of railroads. Lots and lots of money, always at the expense of the laborers, and God help us, clearly at the expense of the Native Americans. We raped, robbed, and pillaged their land for resources, as well as to build our trains and ship all sorts of human beings <clears throat> out to the territories that used to belong to the Native Americans. Billionaires, railroads, biggest, 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 and then inherited wealth and finance, banking. Okay, some wealthy railroad owners use their immense wealth to influence politicians. You can think bribes, of course, and take advantage of Western farmers, ranchers, and miners who depended on the railroad. They depended to be on the railroads to be able to ship their products. However, they were allowed to charge whatever they wanted because it was such an unregulated industry. That's because of laissez-faire economics, uh, which means there's no regulation and big business got away with almost everything in the Gilded Age. Stanford used political ties to secure a government contract for the Transcontinental Railroad. You've heard of Stanford. And railroads were often corrupt. He overcharged $23 million in the Credit Mobile Year scandal. $23 million. Come on, that's a lot. I'm going to turn this a little bit more. That is a lot of money at that time. Just think about it at that time. This looks a little shaky. I'm not sure I'd feel very safe on that. $417 million today. Jay Gould embezzled millions. He's probably one of the nastiest guys in history, especially in the 19th century. Jay Gould ranks among the most famous robber barons of the Gilded Age. Uh, robber barons acquired wealth by generally corrupt or shady, shady means. A sinister, sinister person, according to Joseph Pulitzer. Pulitzer Prize fame. You have to, you have undertaken to cheat me. I won't sue you, for the law is too slow. I will ruin you. Vanderbilt uh, would drive other people out of business. He didn't care about going to legally challenge this. He would just ruin his competitors. Stock watering. Railroad companies often overinflated the worth of their stocks so that when they sold them, they would make huge profits. They said that their stocks were way more valuable than they were, so when they sold them, they made tons of money. It's illegal. Eventually, railroad owners created defensive alliances to show profits, the first trusts or pools. So trusts or pools to you are a little bit less, um, that's less that you would know that kind of thing, but I know you guys have heard of monopolies. A monopoly means that you own all of it. You own all of it. And so all the railroads would form together and they would charge excessively high rates or whatever business, they would all form together and they create monopolies so that everybody charged the same prices and they were always high. America was slow to combat the abuses by the railroads. They got away with this for decades and decades. Uh, I want you to see this political cartoon. I don't know if you can see very well from there, but it shows cloth workers average $9 a week. This is the late 19th century, a week, $9 a week. Linen workers, $11 a week. Iron workers, blazing hot, blazing hot, fire hot. Iron workers, $7 a week. Lumber, $6 a week. Leather workers, seven. Paper workers, $6 a week. A week. That's insane. Even in today's dollars, that would be insane. 
the Grange is an alliance of farmers who try to uh, pull together their resources to try to combat these uh, horrific rates by the railroad companies. All of those farmers out there try to pull together in the Grange. Grange, Grange, Grange. Grange equals farmers. Farmers, farmers, farmers. Uh, in the absence of federal regulation with growing pressure from farmers, states finally began to re regulate the railroads. Not the federal government, states. So the Interstate Commerce Act, we've talked about it before, 1887, the Interstate Commerce Act, and it regulated uh, going from one state to another state. That was only the railroad that it could have affected like that for the most part. It wasn't very successful. So banned re rebates and pools, they still did it. Required railroads to publish openly so they couldn't, uh, their rates openly so they couldn't cheat customers, they still did it. Forbade unfair discrimination against shippers. It all still happened. The regulation wasn't there. They said you're not allowed to do it. They still did it because it wasn't enforced. So the Interstate Commerce Commission was created. Today, the Interstate Commerce Commission equals all sorts of things, railroads, trains, uh, cars, shipping, trucks, uh, boats. It is everything, then mostly railroads. So mechanization, mechanization, mechanization. This is uh, the Gilded Age. Again, it's the second industrial revolution. The second industrial revolution equals steel, making steel. Uh, I can't say it enough. 1807, the first steam boat. 1819, the first steam ship. 1829, the rocket, the first steam train. And then by the 1840s and 60s, railroads all over the world. But before that time, horses, carriages, wagons, walking, boats uh, on rivers that you use poles or oars to, to paddle, ships with sails. Uh, this is the 19th century is massively advanced compared to the entire past 10,000 years that we've survived in this world ever since we were hunters and gatherers 10,000 years ago. The big picture, the United States experienced a second and more profound industrial revolution. The first one started in England with textile factories. Uh, in the late 1800s, as several factors combined to transform the nation into the world's preeminent manufacturing power. The captains of industry were corrupt and raped, robbed, and pillaged the whole country, especially the laborers and, of course, the Native Americans, but they transformed our country into the greatest economic power of the world. I don't know. I mean, they devastated people, but we're the greatest nation on earth, and that started probably in the Gilded Age. By 1860, we were the fourth largest manufacturer in the world. Remember, that's just before the Civil War. We're the fourth largest. By 1894, we were the number one manufacturer in the entire world, the largest manufacturer in the entire world. Uh, these are all the different countries at that time. So 1880, um, everybody else, Britain was huge, and it keeps going smaller and smaller, and the slice that America has keeps getting bigger and bigger. 32% by 1913. Wall Street equals banking, banking, banking. Uh, the U.S. had abundant capital. So you guys all know the word capitalism. Capitalism. Capitalism equals money. It equals banking. It equals money. It equals money. It equals money. So when they say they have abundant capital, they're talking about cold hard cash. Uh, and a stable ma a banking system, thus money to invest. So uh, having all of that money and being able to invest it in our businesses made our businesses get bigger, which made our banks get bigger, which made our businesses get bigger. Kept going. Wall Street. The U.S. fully exploited the rich supply of natural resources, coal, iron, and oil. We raped, robbed, and pillaged our own country. Uh, everybody did around the world. Uh, Britain, as you know, imperialism, they just went and raped and robbed and pillaged all over the earth. So did many other European countries like France and uh, Britain. Who else? Uh, who cares? Uh, we did it to our own country. What had been Native American soil, we now did it to our own country. And again, always at the expense of laborers. These people, nobody mattered. It didn't matter. They were paid pennies on the dollar. They made very little money. Uh, and we just tore up our entire land, our beautiful land. Again, it made us the greatest nation on earth. I don't know. What, what, how do you balance? Massive immigration drove down wages, making labor cheap 
exploitable and expendable. Uh, tons and tons and tons of immigrants. In the 1850s, we had people from Britain, from Germany, uh, uh, from the north and the west of Europe. And then by the late 1890s, early 1900s, we have people from, well, also, uh, you know, Irish, the potato famine was in the 1840s, the late 1840s and 1850s. So millions of Irish came here because they were dying when the potatoes rotted in the ground. And then in the late 1900s, a lot of Italians and a lot of Jews from Eastern Europe. And so all of these people were scorned. All of the immigrants were scorned. It's not different than the debate we have now about immigration. Uh, now, many of us came from these people and we're all of European stock and nobody really knows any differently. Um, so massive immigration as a result, it drove down prices because somebody would get hurt or die or something bad would happen in the factory. They're like, next, send the next person in. Here we go, pay them nothing. And if they get hurt, oh well. Okay, American ingenuity and mass production, mass production were being perfected with the help of the Bessemer steel making process. You have to know the Bessemer steel making process. Henry Bessemer is from England. He created a steel making process that we used to have just a small, just small um, to, to, to melt the steel, the, the iron ore to melt it so we could create steel. And so the steel making process, they have created a huge thing. Like uh, if you think about the dump trucks, very, very vi big uh, cauldron to be able to make this steel in. And it ramped up production way more than ever. It was huge, it was massive. And that changed everything. Carnegie went to England and learned about the Bessemer steel making process and brought that home and became exceedingly rich, one of the richest men in America at that time. So you have to know that Henry Bessemer created a steel making process that made it go from just this small thing that we used to use to a very, very huge cauldron that they now use. Then, then too, then also in the late, 20th, late 19th century. Henry Bessemer. Okay, so other important geniuses of our world Important inventions include cash registers, stock tickers, typewriters, refrigerated cars, Swift and Armor, we talked about it, meat packing in Chicago, electric dynamos, that's uh, uh, generators, and the electric railway. Um, think San Francisco, that we have electricity to have cable cars. And Thomas Edison invented the incandescent light bulb, the phonograph, and thousands of patents. Alexander Graham Bell, 1876, invented the telephone, launching a new age of communication, especially uh, early on, early on, early on in major big cities like New York City. Other big cities are the first places to get the telephone. But there it is, 1876. Are you serious? Are you serious? We all have our phones now that are our computers that are everything to us. And that's only 1876. That's 150 years ago. Less than 150 years ago that we actually have phones. Before that, we talked about it, the telegraph wires, Samuel Morse, doot, 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 doot. that was it. That was our way to communicate before this. First words he said, Mr. Watson, come here, I want to see you. Okay, corporate mergers, trusts, trusts, trust, trust. You have to know about trust. Um, those are when they merged a bunch of businesses together to create incredibly powerful corporations that nobody could even touch. We couldn't even come close. The laissez-faire system, no regulations, capitalism, everything at the expense of capitalism. Capitalism gets what it wants. The Gilded Age corporations freely devised many ways to eliminate competition, to form various forms of monopolies and maximize profits. Get rid of the competition, get rid of the competition, then you can charge whatever you want. Most ways Gilded Age America was a plutocracy. Crassy means government, Pluto means the rich. Plutocracy. We were a plutocracy. The wealthy, wealthy, wealthy got richer and richer and richer at the expense of the poor, at the expense of our natural resources, at the expense of the Native Americans. The rich got exceedingly wealthy during the Gilded Age. Rockefeller, Vanderbilt, Henry Ford, H.L. Hunt, I don't know what he was. Andrew Carnegie, Steele. Sam Walton. So today, Sam Walton has died, but his family combined today just the people that inherited his wealth equals 196 billion dollars today uh, waltons equals walmart 
Jeff Bezos, you know this, Amazon, I haven't had a chance to get a picture up there. Amazon, this is today, this is, I just checked today, it's August of 2020. Jeff Bezos is worth $144 billion and he had to give $30 billion to his ex-wife. His ex-wife got $30 billion. Come on. Larry Ellison, I don't know, oh no, Oracle. Larry Ellison is Oracle. He's $59 billion. Warren Buffett is $67 billion. Um, he's, I think, in real estate type stuff. And Bill Gates, you know, is Microsoft, $106 billion. 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 That's like 100,000 million. I don't even know what it is. I don't even know what a billion equals. I don't know what the number is right before 1 billion. 999,999 million thousand. I, don't, I can't even say it. I have no idea. Trusts. Trusts are big corporations that pull together to get rid of the competition. You have to know trusts, uh, corporations. Industri industrialists thrived with the government's laissez-faire approach to business using various methods to eliminate the competition and maximize the profits. You just have to know the whole thing that we've talked about, all of this class so far, corporations can do anything they want, laissez-faire economics, people that get screwed are the poor immigrants, everybody else. Business leaders consolidated their corporations into trusts and holding companies and created monopolies. Owners of monopolies used technological innovations. The more money they got, the more technology they improved their, their uh, factories, the more they improved their factories, the less skilled labor we needed, and the more we just needed people to do simple things, uh, making things. It was unskilled labor was necessary, and since it wasn't skilled labor anymore, all those skilled laborers lost their jobs in favor of unskilled laborers. As you can imagine, if you have a skill, you get paid a lot more than if you don't have a skill. So they got rid of skilled laborers because their technological advances and innovations in their factories made it be unskilled work. And as a result, they could pay literally almost nothing to their workers, and it didn't matter if they got hurt, as you know. Uh, so they exploited natural resources and the growing labor force. Again, natural resources are big, mountains and lands and everything else that we dug, dug, dug coal out of. Still today, 21st century, we are still digging coal, coal, coal out of mountains. Sadly, today we have a thing called mountain topping. That they now have a mountain, they just start scraping off the top. They still just, keep, instead of going down into the mountain, they just take it, they take it away until there's not even a hill or a mountain there anymore. It's just, there's one, I saw it out toward Gallatin. There's the same thing uh, off of, um, what is that thing called, Vietnam Vets, that they are taking away the hill for mining of some sort. Andrew Carnegie introduced the use of vertical integration in which a company controls all aspects of an industry. They dig up the coal, they get the iron ore. Every single step that's needed in the process, he owned all of the steps, and owning all of the steps meant that he had vertical integration. He didn't need anything else from anybody else. So other people, if they had, he had to buy stuff from other people, they could jack up the prices because they know that he needed that coal or they needed that iron ore. So if he had all of the processes and he owned all of them, nobody could ever screw him. He could build and make anything he wanted all of his own accord. John D. Rockefeller, it's known as horizontal integration with oil refining taking over or merging with competitors to establish a monopoly. In other words, he had all of the oil refineries. The Standard Oil Company brooks no competition. Its settled policy and firm determination is to crush out all who may be rash enough to enter the field against it. It hesitates at nothing in the accomplishments of this purpose to crush out the competition. This is Congress. Congress said this about John D. Rockefeller. He mastered horizontal integration. It's not vertical integration up and down. It means that he owns all, all of oil refining. So you guys have all seen oil derricks that spew oil out of it, spew oil out of it. He didn't own those. He didn't care about those because that was all oil. But that oil, you couldn't put that in a car. Well, cars don't exist yet. But you couldn't put that into something, in machines or anything like that. It's got to be refined, uh, like pasteurized milk. It's got to be refined. It's got to be made pure. And so to do that, you have to take that oil and send it away to be refined an oil refinery. So he didn't care about like going out and putting oil derricks all over the earth. All of those people that did that, he can have as many as they want. They all had to take it to him 
to have the oil refined and he would charge them huge prices to refine it. And as a result, he crushed out everybody else. Any other oil refineries that tried to operate, they would go out of business because he would crush them. And then he would buy them at bottom dollar prices. I think we talked about with some of you with the gas station, you know that if there's like gas stations on every corner on a city block, that all the gas stations have relatively the same prices. It's impossible that they don't because if they have a way lower price, obviously everybody is literally gonna line up to go to the gas station that has a 30 cent less per gallon. And so as a result, all of the gas stations have basically the same price. That's why uh, gasoline wars like really hurt those companies because they have to keep making their prices lower, prices lower, prices lower to beat out the competition. That's why they never really do. Almost every gas station on every corner has about the same price because they are just screwing each other if they don't. Okay, so here it is. Vertical integration. Vertical integration is this. This is Carnegie. Carnegie owns all of the processes. He owns everything he needs to own to be able to operate his business. Uh, from production of raw materials, transportation of raw materials, processing raw materials, transporting finished products, and then selling to the consumer. Carnegie has all of that. Uh, Rockefeller's like, I don't need all of it. I just need one step. I don't need to have the oil derricks. I don't need to transport the oil. I just need to refine the oil. Then somebody else, I, they can buy it and sell it. Everything else, I don't care. He just owned all the oil refineries. Horizontal integration equals Rockefeller with oil. Vertical integration equals Carnegie at the Homestead Steel Works in Pittsburgh. And that is vertical integration. 14th Amendment. Um, we've all talked about it. The, uh, the Reconstruction Amendments are the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. The 13th Amendment means no slavery anywhere except in freaking jail or prison, which is horrifying. 14th Amendment was if you are born in the United States, born in the USA, if you are born here or a naturalized citizen of the United States, then you have all of the civil rights of being a citizen and the due process of being a citizen. Well, way back then, they made it so that corporations are people. And still today, 150 years later, corporations are literally considered human beings. They're considered people. And therefore, they have civil rights of people. It's insane. Corporate lawyers use the 14th Amendment to defend trust, arguing corporations were big people entitled to their property. Many judges agree, and they gave corporations personhood. Because of the 14th Amendment, it defends corporations. How is that possible? Oh, that's my picture. That's my picture over there on the wall. Um, they, they said that this was like, actually they set it up as like some sort of advertising thing. But supposedly the men really did sit there. They didn't necessarily eat lunch there all the time, but it's a pretty cool picture. Uh, supremacy of steel. What they are sitting on are skyscrapers. They are building skyscrapers. So some of you know that we talked about Otis. Um, Otis is for elevators. Uh, he made elevators. If you go in any elevators anywhere, most likely it says O-T-I-S on it, Otis, which is a human being who created elevators, but more importantly, the brakes on the elevators. Remember, there's big old cables and steel cables that, that pull the elevators up and down. So before you can create uh, skyscrapers that are like 40 stories high, nobody's going to walk up all of those stories day after day after day, walk up and walk down. So you had to have viable elevators. And Otis is a captain of industry who made those elevators, but more importantly, he made the brakes so that you wouldn't go screeching, crashing down to the earth because the brakes wouldn't grab and stop the elevator. The technology to have the elevator had existed for a long time. They used it in mines. They used it a lot of other places. But then for buildings and skyscrapers, he invented a way to be able to make those the brakes, uh, something grab onto those steel, steel, whatever and grab it and make the, the eleva elevator stop. And then the other thing you had to have was steel. We had to have steel that was strong enough to be able to support skyscrapers. So in the late 1890s and early 1900s, we have skyscrapers all over the country, all over the world, because we are now creating steel. Steel industry was do dominated by Carnegie, established itself as the sturdy frame of late 1800s US manufacturers. So the late 19th century in the Industrial Revolution, 1865 to 1900s, that is Carnegie. Um, as you know, they're called the Pittsburgh Steelers, and that's because Homestead Steel Plant was just outside of Pittsburgh. Carnegie, Carnegie, Carnegie equals steel. He is a captain of industry. 
In the 1860s, steel was scarce and expensive, so railroads had to be built with iron, but iron is, is much softer and much more malleable, and so the rails could bend or break, and it was more dangerous. Once steel was invented, all of the railroads uh, tracks were built with steel. And, I mean, railroads, trains, train cars, everything, steel. And here's production of steel. 1875, almost no steel. By 1915, the U.S. produced more steel than England and Germany combined. That is uh, Carnegie, and that's why he became one of the richest men of the 19th century. There it is. Bessemer steel making process. Used to have to be like this, and then later we have these big old cauldrons that they be, were able to make steel from. That's because of Henry Bessemer. The steel making process equals Henry Bessemer. Carnegie brought that back to America. So the price of making steel in 1867, it was $166 to make steel per ton. Now, uh, in 1895, just 30 years later, it was $32. So they, because of this process, it was way more efficient and cheaper to make steel. The uh, U.S. had coal for fuel, iron for smelting, and other ingredients for steel, and therefore led the world in its production. Because we have these things. We had coal. We had iron. We had everything that they needed here in the United States of America. We didn't have to go anywhere else to import anything to be able to make steel. And that's why we we're off to the races, because we owned all of those things in our country. Of course, we raped, robbed, and pillaged our own land to get all of these things, but it made us one of the wealthiest nations on earth. Um, by the way, coal uh, burns hotter and longer. Uh, when we were young, we used to have a Franklin stove in the corner, and we used wood to put in the Franklin stove. As some of you know, if you have a fireplace, that you would use wood. But uh, also when you've been outside and you have like the fireplace outside or you have the fire pit and you put wood in it, a lot of you know that you just have to keep putting wood that the wood doesn't last very long, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour for a big log, that wood burns very fast and it doesn't burn very hot. And so coal burns a lot hotter. My father used to send me to the train station with a coal bucket and a coal glove to go get coal. I had to go buy coal. I had to take my little Ford Pinto, which could blow up, by the way, some of you know that. I had to take my little Ford Pinto, drive to the train station to get coal. I was like, why do you have to go to the train station to get coal? Dad's like, where else would you get it? And I was like, well, I don't know, but why would you get it there? The reason was this coal is very heavy, and the train cars would bring the coal, and then they would dump the train cars out right by the tracks, and it didn't make sense to move it anywhere. So everybody went to the train station to buy their coal right there for the people that went to buy coal like I did when I was growing up. And go to buy coal. And so I had a coal bucket and a coal pail, and I would buy coal, and then we put that in the Franklin stove because it burns way longer and way hotter. During the winter, we never didn't have our, our Franklin stove fire going because the coal would keep it burning even through the night when we were asleep. If you just had wood, it would burn out. It wouldn't still be going in the morning, not unless there was a lot of it in there. So coal burns hotter and longer. That's Carnegie. Andrew Carnegie rose from poverty to dominate the steel industry. We're gonna talk about that in the future because, because of him, Everybody's like, oh, you should be able to go to rags to riches. Uh, he was an immigrant, and he was poor, and he became one of the richest men in America. So if he can do it, you can do it. Pull yourselves up by your bootstraps. You can be rich too, just like Carnegie. Carnegie was based in Chicago, I mean in Pittsburgh, and he made one quarter of all the steel in the United States of America. In today's dollars, 25 million. He made every year 25 million a year. Today, that's $615 million a year that he would make. So here's what you have to know. This is Pierpont Morgan was a wealthy banker and stockbroker. He bought out Carnegie for $400 million. Today, it would be $9 billion, $9 billion. So when Carnegie was ready to retire, he sold Carnegie Steel and J.P. Morgan, who was a banker, J.P. J.P. Morgan, who was a banker, and he created U.S. Steel. U.S. Steel still exists today. It is a very huge company still today. What they're showing you is J.P. Morgan is this very big, 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 important person in the United States, the, the government. This, this represents the United States. When you see Uncle Sam, that represents the United States, that he was way more powerful than we were. In the late 19th century, early 20th century, J.P. Morgan, a banker and a steel tycoon, was way stronger and more powerful than the entire United States government. 
then the president, then Uncle Sam, then the government. Uncle Sam is a cartoon, political cartoon character that we use then and we still use today to represent America. J.P. Morgan also had Rosacea and deformed nose. He hated being photographed. He was never photograph, uh, photographed. He hated it. Uh, he launched United States Steel Corporation, the first billion dollar corporation in the world. He made over a billion dollars. U.S. Steel, it still exists today. Just like Standard Oil, um, uh, Rockefeller. Rockefeller created Standard Oil and Standard Oil still exists today and it is still a massive industry. Rockefeller and the birth of big oil. John D. Rockefeller's Standard Oil employed ruthless measures to undersell, outproduce, and eventually overtake the competition, giving rise to the greatest monopoly in U.S. history. Standard Oil, remember that was horizontal integration. That means that he only cared about oil refining. Everybody could make their oil, dig it out of the ground. He's not going to bother with that. Other people can sell the oil, not going to bother with that. He had only the oil refining, but as a result, he bought out his competition, destroyed his competition, drove them down into the ground by lowering his prices so they couldn't compete, and then ended up buying them out anyway. So he had all the oil refinery. He had a monopoly. He had it all. Okay, this is crazy. Watch this. In 1859, Drake first sold oil. The very first oil that we have is 1859. Again, that's like 160 years ago. The first oil that we started using oil. Before that, they used whale oil uh, or kerosene. And actually, the oil that we got, we wanted the kerosene. We, we used to throw the oil part out because we didn't know it was important. So kerosene was a type of oil used in lamps, made whale oil obsolete when they started using kerosene. 1870s. Uh, that's what the lamps in the they they were showing you, the street lamps that you would have street lamps back then, and they would use the kerosene in those lamps. I there's I still have a kerosene lamp, so like if the electric goes out, I have kerosene in a lamp. You guys have these lamps, the olden time kind of lamps. Uh, light bulbs and electricity rendered kerosene obsolete. So by 1885, when we start having electricity, um, we kerosene is. No longer desired. Nobody needed it. So this is important. Uh, German inventor Carl Benz, get it? Mercedes Benz. Benz. He's one of the first people to create the, uh, the engine that we use in cars. I think he's the first person. Oil then became necessary and profitable with the invention of the gas-burning internal combustion engine. An internal combustion engine is what makes our cars drive. So he's the first one to be able to make cars drive using oil from an internal combustion engine. And ever since then, oil, people needed oil, 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 and it's become one of the biggest industries on earth. We've hit peak oil. We've, we've about tapped out all the oil reserves on the earth. So these are oil refineries. This is what we're talking about. This is an oil refinery. They make the oil and clean it and purify it and put it in this until it's going to be sold. In 1882, Rockefeller ruthlessly organized Standard Oil and within five years, he controlled 95% of all oil refineries in the U.S., 95% within five years. Within five years, he had all of the oil refineries, and as a result, he could charge whatever prices he wanted to refine the oil. He crushed his competitors by producing superior gasoline for a lower price. He would keep lowering it, and then he'd buy them out once they were destroyed. So government tackles trust. We, this is us trying to combat Monopolies. Uh, when you say the word trust, you should think monopoly. Somebody trying to buy up all of the things like Rockefeller did. Buy up all of the oil refineries. Buy up all of that system of production. By the 18th